for regular work session for June 26th. I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Our first item tonight is the Pledge of Allegiance uh, led tonight by Councilor Hillier. Yeah. All right, that brings us to announcements. We have an update on its Walton YAC activities. Welcome. Why not? Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Bubenick and the members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Alden Wolf. I'm Lucy Austin, and I'm Bradley Knuckles. And we're here to um, explain our recent activities as a part of the Youth Advisory Council. Of course, we'll start with our mission statement. So the YSC's mission statement is, Walton Youth Advisory Council works to improve the lives of youth by building relationships, advocating for diverse needs, and providing a link from youth to government. So one of our recent projects that we worked on was our vertical garden. It's a demonstration project. We got our plants from the garden corner and installed with the help of the parks maintenance team. We're working on creating a web page about the plants and how people can make a wall garden of their own. And we plan to rotate new plants in the future. Uh, we finished up the year by creating a youth survey and this is gonna be used to plan the future YIC projects. We chose to focus on event and activity preferences, issues impacting youth, awareness of ways to get involved and stress management. Um, come join us at concerts in the park, uh, full schedule at waltonoregon.gov re slash recreation. We have concerts Fridays, July 7th and 21st, August 4th and 18th. YC will be there selling uh, snow cones and popcorn. We also went and met at Langer's Entertainment Center this year to discuss future project ideas and how to better meet our mission. Of course, we thank you for letting us have your time tonight. All right. Are all you guys going to be back next year on YAC? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Thank you for your commitment. And coming to school's over in your hair. Jeez. <laughs> Can't ask more than that. Question. Okay. Councilor Brooks and Councilor President Pratt. I just want to thank you. First of all, the snow cones are delicious. So anybody... They're not those dry, weak snow cones, so go get a snow cone at the con concert series. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, my question was around your project. Is there something that you learned about the garden wall that um, really stuck out to you? That Yeah, so as a group, we all did um, our part researching native plants in Oregon, the plants that are most effective on vertical wall gardens and roof gardens. Um, and we really learned a lot about the impact that they have. Not only do they encourage people in, um, in towns and cities to do their impact towards climate change, but also each individual plant, like plants that are adapted to climate change, they really help mitigate uh, carbon emissions and uh, the environmental effect that increasing temperatures in, in cities and residential areas. So they're a lot more impactful. Obviously each uh, wall garden carries its own part, but they're very inspirational and they're fun to make as well. Thank you. I was gonna mention the vertical garden too. It's pretty awesome, but you said something about switching out the plants and like, will you do that like in the fall or how yeah. will that work? Yeah, so sorry, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. but um, like I said, we did our research at the start. We all split it up. We looked at Oregon native plants as well as plants that are adapted to climate change. Um, and we're kind of testing the waters at first. We have, I believe, I'm not sure how many rows we have, but we have a decent amount of plants. We selected a good amount from the garden corner. Um, and we're just kind of testing which plants are best with the sun and the watering schedules that we're adapting to. Um, but as time goes on, we look forward to switching out plants based on which ones survive most. Um, and also if we get public comments on which people have any ideas for plants, they're more effective, but yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you for coming tonight and enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, that brings us to public comment. 
uh, public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the city council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. If you'd like to uh, share your comments with city council, please limit it to about three minutes tonight. Uh, do we have anyone in Zoom who is uh, here for public comment? Okay. Uh, anyone who, oh, okay. Hello there, folks. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi there. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Haley Rosell, and I have been a lifelong resident of Tualatin. I uh, was born and brought home to my uh, parents' home in Tualatin, and I've loved living here. Um, and I always knew that it was a community I wanted to return to uh, when it came time to buy my own home and to raise a family here. Um, recently, I just got married, and my husband and I were so excited to close on a house in Tualatin um, that happens to be situated on the commons. It's a condo. Um, however, about two weeks after we closed, we learned about um, the council's proposal to create two designated homeless um, sleeping camps. Um, and understandably, we we're a little bit nervous about this, given the proximity of the two locations to our condo. Um, we had a lot of conflicting opinions or feelings about this. In part, um, we want and have compassion for people who are homeless, and we want them to have a safe place to be in our community. And we certainly see value in that. Um, on the other hand, um, we're also nervous about uh, what this could mean for um, our future children um, and the safety of, of us and for them and for the community as well. Um, in particular, one of these designated lots is a gravel lot that's about 500 feet away from our front door. Um, we close on this property tomorrow, so we're excited about that. Um, and we recognize that the other lot is over by the police station, um, and that has a much greater capacity and I guess my primary point tonight is that I'm hoping to urge the council that when you vote tonight to consider just passing um, one of the two designated locations, um, that one location being the one that's located closer to the police station because of its greater capacity. Um, from what I understand, that lot could host as many as um, 70 to 90 campsites versus the one that's closer to um, the commons, which could only host as many as 20. Um, we understand that the current homeless population in Tualatin, and this has been the situation for the past five or so years, has been um, five to 15 homeless individuals in the city. Um, as such, it seems like having a campsite that could host as many as 70 um, feels like it uh, takes into consideration our current situation as well as um, a, a plentiful buffer for if we have more homeless individuals in the future. So um, anywho, that's that's my piece for the evening. Um, thank you for your time. And um, I appreciate all of your hard work. Okay. We'll make that part of public comment for later on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else on, and I'm that's not on tonight's agenda. Yeah, we should ask. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Rick. Is your public comment having to do with the time, place, and manner of camping this evening? Yes, it does. That's a little later in the agenda. This is just public comment right now on things that are not on the agenda. Okay, I will wait. I'll circle back to you. Thank you. All right. Um, bye bye. Anyone else? All right. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next item on our uh, agenda tonight, which is the consent agenda. The consent agenda. These are items that are considered routine uh, and they will be adopted by one motion unless someone in the council would like to have it pulled off the agenda and heard uh, separately later tonight. Tonight, the consent agenda consists of item number one, consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of June 12, 2023. Item two, consideration of resolution number 5703-23, authorizing the city of Tualatin to enter into a letter of agreement with Washington County Disability, Aging, and Veteran Services. 
Item number three, consideration of resolution number 5704-23, authorizing the purchase and replacement of Tualatin Community Park field lighting through a cooperative procurement program. Item number four, consideration of resolution number 5705-23, increasing the authorized amount of the professional service agreement with AKS Engineering for the 65th Avenue Nyberg Sewer Rehab Project. Item number five, consideration of resolution number 5706-23, authorizing personnel services updates for non-represented employees for fiscal year 2023-2024. Item number six, consideration of resolution number 5707-23, approving and authorizing provision of workers' compensation insurance coverage to volunteers of the city of Tualatin. Item number seven, consideration of resolution number 5708-23, authorizing the city manager to execute grant amendments for two metro area communications commission grants and appropriating special purpose revenues in the city's general fund during the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Gotta scroll. Item number eight, consideration of resolution number 5709-23, authorizing changes to the fiscal year 2022-2023 adopted budget. Item number nine, consideration of resolution number 5710-23, amending water, sewer, storm water, road and parks utility fee rates inside the city of Tualatin and rescinding resolutions 5629-22. Item number 10, consideration of resolution number 5712-23, amending the city of Tualatin fee schedule and rescinding resolution 5627-22. Item 11, consideration of resolution 5713-23, awarding a contract for construction of the Sandalwood Water Quality Swell Retrofit. And finally, item number 12, consideration of resolution number 5714-23, authorizing the city manager to execute grant agreements for a state homeland security program, SHSP grant. Does any counselor like to have an item pulled from the consent agenda and heard later tonight. I move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the uh, consent agenda as read. Any discussions on those motions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. That brings us to a public hearing. Uh, item number one, consideration of resolution number 5711-23, adopting the city of Tualatin budget for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2023, making appropriations, appropriations, levying ad valerium taxes and a category, damn, I sound tight tonight, categorizing the levies every year. I can't get this. It's usually, you know, getting tripped up over ad valorium. And you stole my first line right after I say thank you, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Don Hudson, your Assistant City Manager and Finance Director here with the City. And you do have in front of you the Resolution 5711-23, which does all those things the Mayor just told you. We are required under statute to pass a budget, adopt the budget before July 1st. Back in May, we staff presented the uh, proposed budget to the budget committee, which was then approved on May 30th by the committee uh, and forwarded on to you for consideration of adopting. There are uh, opportunities for the council, in, in addition to that adopt or approved budget, to make changes up to 10% uh, of the total, uh, total amount of the, that fund. Staff is proposing three types of changes this evening in front of you. The first type is for carryovers for items that we anticipated when the budget was put together to be received by received or paid for by June 30th. We have some items tonight that will not be or not anticipating to be received by the end of this week, and we're asking those to be carried over. The impact of that is to add to that budget line, and then it also increases the beginning fund balance in that appropriate fund. The second type of change we have in front of you this evening is increase of expenditures for items that were that have arisen since the budget was put together and approved by the budget committee. The third type of change is a transfer of existing appropriations from one category to another within that fund. So under that first type of change, we have two different uh, funds that are impacted. 
first in the general fund and the information ser services budget, we have some network I, network parts that were not received prior to June 30th, will not be received prior to June 30th in the amount of $15,260. Additionally, we had some water quality facility maintenance that was, was scheduled that will also not be completed by the end of this week. And that will impact the stormwater operating fund in the amount of $32,000. The second type of change that I, that I described will also impact the information services budget. And that is for a federal grant that we received in the amount of $76,155. It's a federal grant for the city's infrastructure access, con access control system upgrade. Easy for me to say. <laughs> it's actually not the SCADA, but uh, but yeah, then I'd have to define what SCADA is. So, uh, so the last type of change that we have is in the water development fund. So funds that have no operating expenditures budgeted cannot have an operating contingency, which kind of makes sense. Uh, so when we made an adjustment to the, to the budget before we uh, approved it, there was one piece of uh, $560 remaining in that operating contingency line item. So I need to ask you to move it from the contingency category into the reserve category. So the total amount of the budget with these proposed amendments is $153,629,340. In addition, the resolution in front of you imposes our city's permanent tax rate of $2.2665 per thousand of assessed value for operations and $4,764,595 for bonded debt service. By adopting the attached resolution, the city will be able to operate, expend money, and incur liabilities for fiscal year 23-24, beginning on July 1st. At that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Don? I move that we um, adopt resolution number 5711-23. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 5711-23. Any discussions on those motions? Excuse me, Mayor. You? This is a public hearing. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. That's right. But... <laughs> uh, so do I have anyone in the audience or in Zoom land who'd like to speak in favor of adoption of resolution number 5711-23? Right. To have anyone in Zoom land or here in the meeting uh, who would like to uh, voice their opposition to passage of resolution 5711-23. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> now yep. pass away, please. Now, all right. So, please do. We adopt resolution number 5711-23. Second. All right. If we have a motion and a second and held a public hearing on resolution of 5711-23, any discussions on those motions? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. Another Thank year you. down. Another year down. Thank now you start much. on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that brings us to general business. Item number one, consideration of ordinance number 1475-23, prohibiting and regulating camping in the city of Walton. Welcome, Megan. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Wait for my slide deck. All right, thank you, Bates. Uh, so I was here on June 12th um, during the work session on the same topic, and I am back with the ordinance, which is included in your packet. Um, tonight, what I'm going to do is review some background information. It'll look pretty similar to last time. I have the updated ordinance number 1475-23 with a few changes after our discussion at the last meeting, um, and then a slide with next steps. All right. So um, the U.S. Supreme Court established the principle that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the state from punishing an involuntary act or condition if it is the unavoidable consequence of one's status or being. In the last few years, there's been a few cases that moved up through the court system to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Those two cases are listed on the screen there, Martin v. Boise and Johnson v. City of Grants Pass. 
And in those cases, they found that cities cannot punish a person for sitting, sleeping, or lying on public property when that person has no place else to go. Therefore, laws banning outdoor camping when that person has nowhere else to go are deemed unconstitutional. Then in 2021, the Oregon legislature enacted House Bill 3115. From a legal standpoint, House Bill 3115 restated the judicial decisions found in those two previous cases. Um, the one addition they made is that they instituted a hard deadline of July 1st, 2023 for cities and counties to implement. Um, again, the case law and state law are both specific to public property. This does not pertain to private property. Twalton does have an ordinance on our books currently, um, Twalton Municipal Code Chapter 612-030. Um, it is out of compliance with state law. As discussed on June 12th, Ordinance Number 1475-23 would replace the existing ordinance, bringing the city into legal compliance. Homelessness is a large and complicated issue affecting many people and communities, including Tualatin. As we discussed at the previous meeting and Tualatin, we do have folks experiencing or unsheltered homelessness, but largely the issue is not visible to the general public um, in terms of outdoor camping. That brings me to, ooh, excuse me, went one too far. All right, here we go. Um, so next I'll review the amendments to Tualatin Municipal Code chapter 6-12-0330 which are included as exhibit A in your agenda packet. Um, before doing that, I wanna point out section four of the ordinance itself. It declares an emergency, which allows the ordinance to take effect immediately upon its passage. Um, in addition, ad adoption of the ordinance tonight does not mean that we cannot make changes in the future. In fact, we believe that we will need to make changes in the future as we learn more about circumstances from additional case law, implementation in Tualatin, implementation regionally, and regional work to address shelter capacity and other wraparound services. All right. So the ultimate goal is to transition people experiencing unsheltered homelessness into shelter and to permanent supportive housing. Much of this work is happening at the county level. And as discussed, we will work on getting an update for the city council on that work at an upcoming meeting. Uh, we have four goals for this ordinance. The first of which is legal compliance with House Bill 3115. The second is to provide clarity for city staff implementing and enforcing the time, place, and manner regulations. We look to be consistent where possible with neighboring jurisdictions. And then we also look to balance the intended use of properties with compassion for people experiencing homelessness. So the following slides are copies of what's included in the ordinance. So I'll walk through those slide by slide. So first, um, camping is prohibited in the city of Tualatin. Uh, we figured we'd start there so that I don't decide to go pitch a tent in community park when I can't get a reservation um, at an Oregon State Park. Um, and then it says that there are three exceptions to this. Um, the first exception, which is what we'll detail later in the ordinance, has to do with you don't have shelter available. And then the following two are additional exceptions. All right. So this slide includes the time regulations, um, which as we've discussed previously are 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. is when camping would be permitted, assuming that the other place and manner regulations are followed. This slide includes the place regulations and you'll notice it's in yellow highlighted. That's an addition made from our last meeting to include the wetland protected areas. Otherwise, the place regulations are the same as they were discussed at the last meeting. I do have later slides that include maps that we'll take a look at again. Um, but generally, it restricts camping on outdoor property, public property to most of the city, with the exception of two lots. All right, this is slide one of two that detail the manor regulations. Um, there were no changes to this section. There was one change to this section, which is the inclusion of a buffer between campsites. Um, we included the 10 foot buffer for the discussion. Um, so adding a 10 foot buffer would limit the number of sites on those two locations to approximately 60 different sites between those locations. All right, 
Um, this last slide includes section three of the ordinance, which is the violation section. Um, it is consistent with other jurisdictions here, provides a few different options for enforcement for the police department. All right, so this map is the reverse of what our place regulations include. It shows where you can camp simply because that's easier to see what is still allowed. And it's difficult still to see on this map, but there's the two purple parcels. The first um, is a grassy lot above the train tracks on Southwest Walton Road adjacent to the police department. Um, at this site, ordinance number 1475-23 would allow for 50 sites approximately. That's what that site looks like. The second site here is a gravel lot at the corner of Boonsbury Road and Nyberg Street. The ordinance would allow for 10 potential sites at this location. All right, so the next steps are to adopt the ordinance. Um, as I said earlier, this ordinance takes effect immediately upon its passage. We also discussed coming back to the city council in January of next year with an update on how implementation is going, if not before January. One thing that I'll add is that we'll continue to engage at the regional level and look to schedule an update with the city council. And I will leave it at that. All right. Uh, so with that, I have uh, one person signed up for public comments on this item and uh, you don't have to be signed up if you're sitting here in the audience or if you're in Zoom, but I'll take the, fo the folks here who are in the audience. Uh, Mr. Irvine, and let me get your comments about three minutes, please. Sure, that'll be less than that. Good evening, thank you for um, letting me speak again tonight. I'm learning a lot about the city council and I really appreciate your dedication on a beautiful night like tonight to be here. I wanna give a shout out to Megan. Um, she is really accessible and gives really good information. So I got information that I needed from her um, to help me speak into you. So my question to Megan was, what was the minimum number of sites we need to comply? And what is the minimum num and what is the number of sites we'll be providing? Megan responded back that neither the House bill nor the two ju judicial decis decisions require a minimum number of sites. So that was interesting to me. There's no target number that we're looking for. And then I was reading some of the emails that Twalton residents sent in. And I was, again, impressed with the thoughtfulness of the emails. And then the woman that spoke earlier, um, I'm kind of landing in, in um, their frame of thought, their camp, in the sense of why start with two camps? Why not start with one? There's a lot of things we don't know about how this is actually going to work. There's a lot of guidelines for the people that live in the camps. So why not just start with one camp and preferably the camp by the police station and just see how it works out. We have the other site in the hopper ready to go if need be, but let's start small. Let's start with one and learn. So what's the rush? Why rush with two camps? Why not just start with one? So that's my input for tonight. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have anyone else? Come on up. Just state your name for the record, please. My name is Keith Lyons. I am managing partner of AM 1410 KBNP Radio. We're located at 84th and Seneca, 50 feet away from the second proposed site. We moved from downtown Portland uh, in 2017. I had a, at that time, five and uh, three-year-old granddaughter staying in our workplace at a radio station right off the west end of the Ross Island Bridge. Nice green area on the side yard where an adult couple was totally naked having sex. I didn't need to see that. Certainly, they didn't need to see that. Our property at 84th and Seneca also has a nice big green space next to it. My granddaughter is with us during the summer. I hope they don't have to uh, go through this again. Where we're located is also to the west of the Winona Grange public parking space. Last week, three days in a row, a homeless person was camped out in their Toyota Sienna. We ended up calling the Tualatin police to let them know. Uh, the person finally vacated, I think, at 1145. So the 
hour is set. I mean, they're up at 5.30 when I usually get to work, um, but it took them a number of hours to be removed. Uh, there previously from June 2nd until last Wednesday had been an abandoned car on Southwest 84th that again, we called in the police mainly from a uh, security check and hot weather. We didn't know whether or not someone had passed out or simply abandoned the vehicle. That is the fourth vehicle in the years that we've been there that have been there. I don't want to see that Tualatin area turn into 33rd from Columbia down to the Columbia Edgewater Golf Course, where people are simply coming in, either abandoning their vehicles or creating home shelters for themselves. We have had theft on our property already. Uh, in fact, in the first week that we moved to our location from downtown here to Tualatin, we'd had hoses stolen. I don't know that most homeless people need a hose. I'm sure they want to do their gardening and pretty up their areas, but we've seen that happen. Uh, other businesses around me have voiced the same concerns. Um, I think everybody wants to be compassionate. What I would recommend, if you are not familiar with a gentleman by the name of Kevin Dahlgren, he was with Multnomah County. He worked for the city of Gresham. He reduced their homelessness from 500 people down to 11. And because he butted heads with uh, Ms. Kafori, he was fired because he did his job too well. If you go to the website truthonthestreets.com, it very definitely defines who really wants the help. Uh, one of the statements the present, uh, presenter had mentioned, you can't punish people for not being homeless if there's available housing. There is a lot of available housing that counties and cities have provided, but the individual refuses to go to. And that's a key issue is that individual. So I don't know how the council can deal with that. It's just our concerns are my family and my community. So we would, we would be against it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other folks, come on up, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Roberts. I live in uh, uh, 12 in one in uh, Southwest Mobile Place in Fox Hills. Uh, I did send, it might be one of the emails of the uh, reference there. And actually I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but to the extent that you hear the same uh, information from several people, I'm happy to provide it. But my recommendation would be to proceed slowly. Uh, as you said, with one site instead of two until we have a sense of what the experience becomes, how many people, you know, though we say 50 tent sites, we don't know how many people per tent that would turn into. And uh, I know I was here for the work session a few weeks ago, and the chief said we have a, a small number of people already uh, that the police have experienced, but what will it become when it's uh, 50 people to 100 people uh, on the one site? and concentrate resources on one site instead before we go uh, to two. So I would just strongly recommend that uh, the council consider that and not, not begin with two sites, begin with the one, the large one there. The police station makes a lot of sense to me and a lot of other people. So that's okay. my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone in the meeting room? All right, Nicole. We have folks in Zoom. Okay. Rick, you're up. Can you hear oh, me? Okay. Thank you. Uh, my oh. name's Rick. My name's Rick Smith, and my wife and I have been 31 year residents of Tualatin. And um uh, I want to thank you for providing a forum for public discussion on this regarding this bill and ordinance. And I, I think most of us understand, you know, the city's responsibility to comply um, with with the various laws and regulations out there, as you know, I'm sure many of the residents here also share. 
Um, I just really wanted to, much of my items are in the form of a question of implementation and how it's going to work. And I think these will lead to a similar uh, conclusion and recommendation as to starting with the one site so we can learn um, how uh, it's going to roll out and how we can best manage it. So um, the Tualatin Commons area, for all intents and purposes, at least in my mind, is the identity and kind of the crown jewel <clears throat> of our city. And so given that second proximity that's so ba basically in the commons, um, it just, um, e even though if we find we need a second location, I just didn't know what other sites were considered even before that one when it's such a core element to our city. And um, so uh, given that, I think also, you know, and the monitoring and management of that, you know, we don't want to create another responsibility that puts much more responsibility and taxes our police force. And so what happens to the designated sites when they, if they become overwhelmed or overcrowded and people are wanting to camp, it's, you know, who monitors that site when it's full and then has to turn people away and what happens to the overflow then should that happen? And uh, uh, next, I just, who's going to be responsible to clean up campsites when garbage or debris is left after the camper leaves. We've all witnessed what can happen relative to this in Portland. And that would be a shame to see our city experience that same thing. Um, also, will the city likely be required to provide temporary bathrooms and water facilities as if these do um, turn out to be, um, you know, a lot of people, there's going to be, um, safety, there's going to be hygiene, there's going to be, you know, different needs relative to uh, toilets, water, all that. So is the city going to be responsible for providing that? And should additional services be required beyond just space, time, and regulations that we've seen so far? Again, in other words, bathrooms, water, cleanup, etc. What will be the funding source for that and, and who would manage that? So in summary, I guess, again, I, I think it makes sense to start out with the one site, see how it rolls out, see how populated it becomes, see what's working, what's not, see if we are going to have to provide additional facilities and how that would be managed. And, um, and then we'll learn a, a lot and can then determine at that point, is there a better second site based upon what we learned from the first site so as to not damage the reputation, the livability, the businesses in the surrounding area and, and really all our property values in the city. So um, those are just, I guess, some questions and consideration that I'm just asking that the council consider. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Is there anyone else on, on the Zoom meeting who would like to provide public comment? All right. Uh, with that, I'll have Megan come on back up and Q&A with Megan from counselors. Councilor Reyes. I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, Megan, would it be too much if uh, if you so they I if, if you would you need to go back and and research if there's um, just one camp, campsite available or um, just wondering if that's something that you you would need to do. So the way that the ordinance is drafted currently, it lists the areas that are prohibited. Um, mm -hmm. So there would not need to be any changes to the the ordinance is drafted. 
Uh, practically what we would probably do is put signs that say not open up to the public on either of the sites if that was the direction that the council wanted to go, if you wanted to limit it to one. So the ordinance does not specify these are the areas available. They just say these are the areas that not. And one of the designations under the place restrictions are areas that are not open to the public. So a simple sign would, would fit that description. Thank you. Other Council Gonzalez. Thank you. The, this last caller had a lot of the same questions I was gonna have funding. Um, who pays for that? How does that work? Um, what are established thresholds before those trigger points begin to, to come, come to life? Sure. So the um, House Bill 3115 did not require the city or a county to manage a campsite or create a shelter opportunity. So there isn't a requirement that we provide services. There's only a requirement that there be a place that somebody can go. Um, if we began to see issues, which I think would be witnessed first by our police department um, and enforcement team with trash being left or with um, other behaviors, um, if they were behaviors that were in violation of uh, city law or the ordinance specific to time, place, and manner, there would be enforcement related to those specific behaviors. If there were behaviors that caused other issues that weren't specific to those, I think that's where we would start to evaluate what types of services we would need to provide. Um, and at that point, there would be a variety, we would do an analysis of what types of needs there are. We would come up with estimates for what the cost would be. Unlikely that would be a general fund expense. And right now, should we find, so if we do find somebody sleeping on the sidewalk, what would be the steps? Who would be the people who would go out there? Would it be our police officers, park staff, walking up to them saying, hey, can I help you? Do I need services? And then point them to this direction or the direction that we're going to be choosing. Correct. That's yes, that would be our police department, whether they encountered them directly or if somebody called in and let us know of somebody camping in an area that was prohibited. Our police department would go out and make contacts, lead with education and informational materials and seek voluntary compliance. And if voluntary compliance isn't something that is available, then they would look towards other enforcement actions. Great. I am in agreement that we should start slow first and uh, identify one location and then see where it goes from there. Uh, Council President Pratt first. Well, first, I totally missed that conversation with Councilor Reyes. So could you kind of restate what yeah, we said? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so the question from Councilor Reyes is what would we need to do in order to limit camping, outdoor camping to one site versus okay. two? Um, and my answer was that in terms of the ordinance, we would not need to make any changes. Okay. In terms of practically how we would work that is the easiest option would be to put signs up at one of the sites saying not open to the public because one of the restrictions for place in the ordinance currently is places not open to the public. So a oh, sign will okay. take there. Okay, because I was going to ask about the, it says 20 feet from a building and it, I keep seeing a brick wall at the end of that lot. So I know there must be a building here. So yeah, there's an alleyway that. and then a hedge and then a building. Oh, okay. Um, okay. That was all my questions. Okay, Council Reyes. Yeah, sorry, I missed one question that I have written down. Ideally, it will be, uh, I guess the process will be, and I think it will be good for all of us to listen. Um, is that if we can find an actual shelter that has a bed, right, and a place for these individuals to go, then it will be the campsite that we assign. And then there's probably other if. So it's not, it has, we will go through a process of finding a place, right? Or is that how the ordinance is written? That is how the ordinance is written. Okay. Um, practically to determine whether or not there is a shelter bed available, that's not quite there. Um, it's something that at least Washington County is working towards um, in coordination with law enforcement to develop a method for somebody specifically, a police officer, identifying whether or not there is a shelter bed and whether it meets the needs of the individual experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. Um, and then theoretically they could say, well, there is a shelter bed available to you, therefore you cannot camp outdoors. Um, there are some legal considerations um, or implications related to the location of the shelter. Um, the case law wasn't terribly specific about how proximal that shelter mm -hmm. location needs to be to your community. Mm -hmm. um, a really uh, conservative legal reading would say that that shelter needs to be within your city limits. Practically, that's very challenging, particularly in a metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are 
will eventually be more guidance on what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Council Brooks. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. And thanks everybody who commented. Um, I had a question come up for myself when I was doing some reading this week <clears throat> around what definition of camping is. So my curiosity is around people camping in cars. And does this ordinance cover just people that are, does it cover people that are camping in cars? It does not. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure because I know they're moving cars downtown under this, but they must have done some different things in their city. Um, and then I guess the other thing is, and I know that our chief was up here last time. Um, I, I just, I feel the people's concerns and I think that what's really important is that we have had a ban. And um, so our police department is used to um, working with individuals and um, I, I also want to know, and I think it's really important how this was written so that there's no permanent camping, so that there's no changing of the landscape, um, so that people aren't just there day and night um, if, if they have to be there. And of course, the first choice would be that they would be in shelters, which I think we all think is a more humane way to be for everybody um, and which is the desire on my part and as far as somebody asked that question that's something that the county is does a lot of and um, from what I understand there's different um, sections of the community areas and so um, hopefully we can work with like Tiger and surrounding communities that have more of those resources available in the future. And we have a roadmap as this moves forward in the future. So I just want people to know that we're thinking about it in those, at least for me, we're thinking about it in those terms and trying to also be in compliance with the state and just do the best by our community. I don't think anybody sees um, capacity. We're not gonna put out notifications like, come hang out in 1210 and I really want to also say appreciate all the mindfulness around neighborhoods, parks, um, sensitive uh, natural resources, homes, so that those uh, are protected and we, and we did a good job. And I'm fine with um, slowly rolling out. So the question I have on this is, obviously the sign idea sounds very simple. So what has to be done to do that? Is that just that an administrative thing? Do we have to vote on that? Or is this is the city manager directs it? Yeah, you can just give us direction that that park, that gravel lot is not open to the public. And we will sign it that way. We're going to look at this in January again, right? right? So we can see how it's going. If not before. Right. Okay. That's failure. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question. We are we all have the um, privilege to know what the rules are are going to be that we're stating. So how are people that might want to be on that site going to get to understand that? Is there a plan for signage? And could you speak to that? If we're saying this isn't available, what are we going to direct people to do on the site that is? Please, thank you. Sure. So upon adoption of the ordinance, we'll begin working on public information materials. I think one of the primary pieces that we'll put together is a brochure that includes maps and a list of what you can and cannot do on those sites that our police department and other folks that engage with people who are experiencing homelessness can hand directly to them as they engage with them. So that would include police officers, folks in our parks maintenance division, um, folks at our library, uh, those types of things. We'll also have information available on the website that answers some frequently asked questions and that type of thing. Thank you. I guess I'm more specifically asking, will there be signage on the space on the spaces that say this is what is allowed, this is what is not? Um, at this point, we do not have a plan to put signage in place, um, in part because the way that the ordinance is drafted is it does not designate a specific area. Um, it says these are the areas you cannot. Um, also, because there may be changes 
in the near future, depending on how implementation goes. So we'll rely on public education. Thank Correct. you very much. Councilor Gonzalez. Additional questions around um, people living in cars. So how do we do, how, we're still working through this, I understand, but there's people living in cars. So we're gonna also direct them to go to this location. And so that means they may, they may be parking on the parking lot adjacent to the lot, or they're gonna drive onto the crest, or they're gonna ask, how are we considering those homeless? Sure, so vehicular camping is one of the more fuzzy areas um, that came through as part of the case law and the house bill. And so some cities have tackled it and some cities have chosen not to. We decided not to include it in our ordinance at this point because it wasn't clear how we can and cannot regulate vehicular camping. So currently car camping or vehicular camping would be regulated under our parking code. Uh, and then other types of behaviors surrounding it would of course apply as well. Um, a person would not be permitted to drive their vehicle onto the grassy or the gravel lot and park there. Um, we have restrictions within our parks code, for example, about parking overnight in, in parks parking lots. That's not allowed. Uh, similarly, the parking lot at the library, that's technically not allowed. Um, and then in residential streets, there's, I believe, a 48 or 72 hour window, 72 hour window. So those restrictions would apply currently. Um, this is an area that we anticipate we'll learn more about um, as the next few months progress, and it may be something that we want to revisit with the City Council sooner than January 2024. Um, we anticipate at the point that we would want to make updates, there would be some substantial updates to that chapter because some parts are unclear um, related to how this would apply to unhoused individuals, so that would need some more legal research. Thank you. Discussion, deliberation, is the feeling? Not having that gravel lot, but just to make sure that was public. Oh, I would support having the gravel lot not be publicly accessible at this point, having just by the police station, you know, especially considering we're going to be revisiting this and see how it goes. Others? The rest? I'm, I'm also in favor of um, starting slowly and moving and progressing. So I'm in favor of the police station lot. That's a hell As am I. All right. So uh, I guess this will be a two-step process that we have the uh, reading and adoption of the ordinance tonight. And then once, assuming it passes, because it has to be unanimous since it's an emergency ordinance, uh, at the end of that, we'll just direct uh, city staff to implement the sign, correct? Right. And it doesn't have to be unanimous because it's an emergency ordinance. Okay. It has to be unanimous because you're gonna do first and second first, reading second. Okay. and then the, okay. the adoption has to be unanimous. I'd like to motion for um, Reading by title only of ordinance number 1475 23. First reading. First reading, excuse me. A second. I have a motion and a second for reading, first reading by title, title only of the ordinance. Let me get the right order. Ordinance 1475 23. Any discussions on those motions? Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Council Brooks? Aye. Council President Pratt? Aye. And chair votes I also, Carolyn. Thank you. Ordinance number 1475-23, an ordinance prohibiting and regulating camping in the city of Tualatin. I'd like a motion for a second reading by title only of resolution number 1475-23. Second. Motion and a second for a second reading by title only of ordinance number 1475-23. Any discussions on those motions? Start on this end. <laughs> Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Council Brooks. Aye. Council Hillier. Aye. Council Reyes. Yes. Council President Pratt. I vote aye also. Thank you. An ordinance, ordinance number 1475-23, an ordinance prohibiting and regulating camping in the city of Tualatin. I'd like to motion that we adopt ordinance number 1475-23. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt ordinance 1475-23. Any discussions on those motions? Councilor Hillier? Aye. 
Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor President Pratt? Aye. I vote aye also. It's adopted. And an emergency. Now we just direct you, we don't have to vote on this, we just direct you to put the sign up. I wrote down direction to make the gravel lot not accessible to the public. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Megan. I was scrolling tonight. That was bad as last time. <laughs> wow. Sure. All right. Uh, that brings us to items removed from consent, which we had none. Any council communications? That's Brooks. I just want to say happy Father's Day to all the belated Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Happy Juneteenth for those celebrating and reminder of Pride Month. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. For those of you that are into softball, as everyone should be, um, Twelton City Little League is hosting the District 4 uh, Championship uh, Series up at uh, Twelton High School. So bring your money for your hot dog or your burger and go up and watch some uh, 9, 10, 11 year olds play some softball. Anything else? All right. So don't run out of here yet. We have a TDC meeting after this which I don't have the agenda for here, but I'll grab it here soon. <laughs> Is there an agenda? I didn't see it on the web. <laughs> I don't think any of us have it. Nice. All right. Uh, so do I have a motion to adjourn the city council meeting? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Both. All right. That brings us to the uh, Monday, June 26th, Twalton Development Commission meeting. Uh, at this point, we uh, do public comment, so I'll read that again. This is an opportunity for anyone to speak to the commission on an item that's not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your uh, comments to about three minutes. Is there anyone in the meeting or in Zoom who would like to have a uh, comment on something that's not on tonight's agenda for the commission? Nothing. All right. Uh, so we have on consent agenda tonight, uh, consideration of approval of the Twelfth and Development Commission meeting minutes of January 23, 2023. Uh, anyone want that item removed from consent? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. We now have another public hearing, and Don comes back. I know. Thank God. Consideration resolution number 635-23, adopting the 12th and Development Commission budget, and making appropriations for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2023. Why can't it be that simple for the other one? <laughs> Lawyers. <laughs> Welcome, Don. At that, here's the no, here's the budget, please. No. So you do have in front of you resolution 635-23 to adopt the 12th and Development Commission budget. Again, statutes require a budget be adopted by July 1st. The Budget Advisory Committee approved this budget as well as the city budget on May 30th. There are no changes to the committee approved budget proposed this evening. The total commission budget is $3,466,010 as comprised of budgets, three funds, the Twelfth and Development Commission Administration Fund, the Leviton Projects Fund, and the Southwest Urban Renewal District Bond Fund. By adopting your, this resolution, the commission will be able to operate, expend money, and incur liabilities for fiscal year 2023-24, beginning on July 1st. At that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Don? I'll move that we adopt resolution six thirty. What public hearing? Public hearing. Oh, public hearing. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Q and A. All right. At this point, since it's a public hearing, is there anyone in the meeting here or in Zoom who would like to testify or state their opinion on against resolution six three five dash twenty three? Is there anyone in this meeting room or in Zoom who would like to testify? in support of resolution number 635-23. All right, now you're up. <laughs> we had, first you gotta make a motion. 
Uh, okay. I move that we adopt resolution 635 23. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 635 23. That's not a roll call, is it? Just regular? Okay. Uh, any discussion on those motions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nays? It's unanimous. It's adopted. Thank you. Uh, and with that, do I have a motion for adjournment? So, for a second, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Good night. Record.